I've seen the worst that humanity has to offer. I've walked through jungles, trudged across deserts, and crept through the densest of forests, all in pursuit of things most people believe exist only in nightmares. My name doesn't matter. All you need to know is that I'm a soldier by trade, but not the kind you're thinking of. My battles are fought against creatures that defy logic, beasts that stalk the darkest corners of the earth, waiting for their moment to strike. I was stationed in Brazil back in 94. Officially, it was just another counterinsurgency mission. Unofficially, I was there for something much darker. Reports had surfaced from a remote village deep in the Amazon. Something was snatching villagers, men, women, children. It didn't matter. They'd find their remains days later, half-eaten, like some predator was toying with its prey before finishing the job. The locals called it the Mapinguari, a creature of legend. They described it as a giant, foul-smelling beast, a cross between an ape and a sloth, with a mouth on its stomach that could swallow a man whole. I didn't believe in fairy tales, but I knew better than to dismiss anything outright. The village of São Miguel was about three days' march from the nearest outpost, nestled in a thick canopy of trees that blocked out the sun. When I arrived, the place was a ghost town. Only a few villagers remained, too old or too scared to leave. They eyed me with a mix of fear and hope, as if I might be their last chance. Você está aqui para matar o demônio? An old woman asked me, her voice trembling. I nodded, not bothering to correct her. Demons, monsters, whatever they called it, it was my job to put it down. The first night I set up camp on the outskirts, near where the jungle met the village. I wasn't alone. The old woman's grandson, João, insisted on helping me. He was barely 18, but the look in his eyes told me he'd seen more than his share of horrors. He carried an old shotgun, its barrel worn from use, but his hands were steady as he checked the ammunition. They say it only comes out at night. Juan whispered as we sat by the fire, the flames casting long shadows around us. You believe in the Mapinguari? I believe in killing whatever's out there, I replied, keeping my voice low. I wasn't here to spook him, but I also wasn't here to fill his head with false assurances. That night, the jungle was alive with the sounds of insects and distant animal calls. But as the hours dragged on, a heavy silence fell over the area, so thick you could almost feel it pressing against your skin. It was as if the jungle itself was holding its breath, waiting. Around midnight, we heard it, a low, rumbling noise, like the earth itself was groaning in pain. Juan's knuckles turned white as he gripped his shotgun tighter. I motioned for him to stay put, then grabbed my rifle and moved toward the sound. It was faint at first, a distant thudding, like something massive was moving through the underbrush. I crept forward, every muscle in my body tense, listening. The thudding grew louder, more pronounced, accompanied by the sound of snapping branches. Whatever it was, it was big, and it was getting closer. I spotted movement through the trees, a hulking shadow that seemed to blend in with the darkness around it. I raised my rifle, lining up the sights, but before I could fire, the shadow disappeared, as if it had never been there. My pulse quickened. I wasn't dealing with a wild animal. This was something far more cunning. I returned to the camp where Juan was waiting, his face pale. Did you see it? No, I admitted. But it's out there. The next morning we found more evidence. Large footprints, nearly twice the size of a man's, pressed deep into the soft earth. The edges were blurred, but the shape was unmistakable, something with claws, something not human. We followed the tracks for miles, deeper into the jungle. The farther we went, the denser the foliage became, until it felt like the trees themselves were closing in on us. The air was thick with humidity, and the smell of decay hung in the air. Joan was quiet, his eyes darting around nervously. Around noon we stumbled upon a clearing. In the center was a massive tree, its roots gnarled and twisted, forming a natural barrier around what looked like a shallow pit. Juo moved closer, peering over the edge. He immediately recoiled, covering his mouth with his hand. 
Meu Deus, he whispered. I stepped forward and looked down. The pit was filled with bones, human bones. Some were old, bleached white by the sun, while others were fresh, still clinging to bits of flesh. The stench was overwhelming, a mix of rot and something else, something foul and unnatural. This is its lair, Juon said, his voice barely audible. This is where it takes them. I nodded, my mind racing. Whatever we were dealing with, it wasn't just killing for food. It was something else, something far more sinister. We spent the rest of the day setting traps around the clearing, using whatever we could find. Vines, sharpened sticks, anything that could slow it down. By the time night fell, we were ready. Or as ready as we could be. That night was different. The jungle was silent from the start, as if every creature within miles had fled. Juo and I sat in the dark, our backs to the tree, listening. Hours passed, and I started to wonder if the creature had somehow sensed our trap. But then, just as I was beginning to relax, I heard it. The thudding, closer this time, more deliberate. I raised my rifle, scanning the tree line, but the darkness was impenetrable. Juon was beside me, his shotgun at the ready. The thudding grew louder, until it seemed like it was right on top of us. And then, it stopped. The silence that followed was unbearable. I could hear Juon's ragged breathing, feel the sweat dripping down my back. We waited, every muscle tensed, but nothing happened. Minutes passed, then an hour. Still nothing. Maybe it's gone, Juon whispered, his voice shaky. But I knew better. This thing was toying with us, playing a game. I motioned for Juon to stay still, then slowly rose to my feet, moving away from the tree. I hadn't taken more than a few steps when I heard it. A low, guttural sound, like a growl but deeper, more menacing. I turned, raising my rifle just as something massive burst from the underbrush. It was on me before I could react, knocking me to the ground. I caught a glimpse of it as we struggled, a hulking figure covered in matted fur, its eyes glowing with a sickly yellow light. Juon fired, the blast echoing through the jungle, but the creature barely flinched. It swiped at him with one massive claw, sending him sprawling. I struggled to free myself, but the creature was too strong, its weight crushing me. I reached for my knife, managing to pull it from its sheath just as the creature lunged at me. I slashed wildly, the blade slicing through fur and flesh. The creature let out a horrible noise, a mix between a scream and a roar, then stumbled back, clutching its side. I didn't waste any time. I rolled to my feet, grabbing my rifle and firing at point-blank range. The shot hit the creature square in the chest, and it collapsed, its massive body hitting the ground with a thud. I stood there, panting, my heart racing. Juon was on the ground, groaning in pain, but alive. I moved to help him up, but before I could reach him, I heard it. The thudding again, this time from all around us. I turned, my blood running cold. More shadows emerged from the trees, their eyes glowing in the darkness. There were at least half a dozen of them, all just as massive, just as terrifying. This isn't possible, Juon whispered his voice trembling. But it was. We had stumbled into something far bigger than I had ever imagined. This wasn't just one creature. It was a pack, a family, maybe even a whole species. And they were hunting us. We ran, crashing through the jungle, our breaths coming in ragged gasps. The creatures were right behind us, their thudding footsteps getting closer and closer. I fired blindly over my shoulder, but I knew it was useless. We were outnumbered, outmatched. The jungle was a blur around us, the trees seeming to close in, the underbrush tripping us up at every turn. Juon was falling behind, his injured legs slowing him down. I grabbed his arm, practically dragging him along, but I knew we couldn't outrun them. We burst into another clearing, this one much smaller, surrounded by thick vines. There was no way out, no escape. We were trapped. 
I turned, raising my rifle, ready to make my last stand. The creatures emerged from the trees, moving slowly, deliberately. They knew they had us. The leader, the biggest of the group, stepped forward, its eyes locked on mine. I could see the intelligence in those eyes, the malice. This wasn't just a hunt, this was personal. I fired, the shot hitting the leader square in the chest, but it barely flinched. It was as if the bullet had done nothing more than annoy it. The creature let out that deep, guttural noise again, something between a growl and a laugh. It knew we were done for, and it wanted us to know it too. Juwam was beside me, his breathing ragged and his face pale with fear. I could see the hopelessness in his eyes, the realization that this was it. But I wasn't ready to give up. I couldn't. I quickly scanned the clearing, looking for anything, anything that could give us an advantage. My eyes landed on the thick vines that hung from the trees above, their roots buried deep in the ground. An idea formed, desperate and reckless, but it was all we had. Juom, I hissed, grabbing his arm. When I say now, you run and grab one of those vines. Climb as high as you can. He looked at me like I was insane, but he nodded. There was no time for questions, no time for doubt. The leader of the creatures took another step forward, and the others followed suit, spreading out to encircle us. I waited until they were close, too close to miss. Then I shouted, Now! Juwon sprinted toward the nearest tree, and I fired my rifle, aiming for the leader's face. This time, the shot found its mark, hitting the creature in one of its glowing eyes. It roared in pain, stumbling back, and the others hesitated, just for a second. That second was all I needed. I ran after Juwon, grabbing a vine and hauling myself up as fast as I could. The creatures were on us in an instant, but they were too big to climb after us. Instead, they snarled and swiped at the base of the trees, trying to shake us loose. Juwon was already halfway up his vine, his face twisted in pain as he climbed. I wasn't far behind, but the creatures were relentless. The leader, now partially blinded, let out a series of growls and grunts, and the others began to circle the trees, searching for another way to get to us. Above us, the canopy was dense, but there was enough space to move between the trees if we were careful. I reached Juan and motioned for him to follow me. We would have to move quickly, jumping from vine to vine, hoping the creatures couldn't follow. We made it to the first tree without incident, then the second. But as we reached the third, I felt the vine beneath me jerk violently. One of the creatures had wrapped its massive claws around the base and was pulling with all its might. Go! I shouted to Juan, pushing him ahead. He hesitated, but the look on my face must have convinced him. He swung to the next tree, just as the vine I was holding snapped, sending me crashing to the ground. I landed hard, the wind knocked out of me, but I managed to roll to my feet just in time to see the leader charging at me. I had no time to think, only react. I grabbed a branch that had fallen nearby and swung it with all my strength, catching the creature across the face. It staggered back, dazed, and I took the opportunity to run. But I didn't head for the trees. I ran deeper into the jungle, away from Juwon, hoping to draw the creatures away from him. I could hear them crashing through the underbrush behind me, but I didn't look back. I knew they were faster, stronger, but I had one advantage. They didn't know this jungle like I did. I led them through the thickest part of the forest, where the trees grew close together and the ground was treacherous with roots and vines. I could hear their snarls growing louder, but I kept moving, ducking under branches and leaping over fallen logs. Finally, I reached a small ravine, one I had spotted earlier but hadn't paid much attention to. It was narrow, only a few feet across, but deep enough that a fall would be fatal. I paused for just a moment, listening. The creatures were close, but not close enough to see me. I took a deep breath, then jumped. I barely made it, my hands scrabbling at the loose earth on the other side as I pulled myself up. I could hear the creatures now, right behind me, but they couldn't see me. They didn't know I had crossed the ravine. 
I lay there, hidden by the underbrush as they arrived at the edge. The leader let out a frustrated growl, and the others joined in. They paced back and forth, searching for a way across, but they couldn't find one. For what felt like hours, I lay there, not daring to move. Finally, one by one, the creatures turned and retreated back into the jungle, their growls fading into the distance. Only when I was sure they were gone did I finally allow myself to breathe. I didn't waste any time. I knew they would be back, and I had to get to Juon before they did. I made my way back through the jungle, following the route we had taken. My heart pounded in my chest, every sound making me jump. When I reached the clearing where Juon and I had been separated, I found him still clinging to a vine, his eyes wide with fear. He looked down at me, relief flooding his face as he saw I was still alive. Come on, I said, helping him down. We're not out of this yet. We moved quickly, staying low and sticking to the shadows. I didn't know where the creatures had gone, but I knew they were still out there, watching, waiting. By dawn, we had made it back to the village. The few remaining villagers looked at us with a mix of awe and terror, but I didn't stop to explain. I gathered our supplies and led Juan out of the jungle, back to the outpost. We didn't talk much on the journey. There wasn't much to say. The jungle had taken its toll on both of us, and we were both too exhausted, too shaken, to process what had happened. When we finally reached the outpost, I filed my report. I didn't mention the creatures by name, didn't describe what we had seen. I knew they wouldn't believe me if I did. Instead, I simply wrote that the mission had been unsuccessful, that the threat remained. As for Juan, he left the outpost that same day, heading back to whatever life he had before. I never saw him again, but I knew he wouldn't forget what had happened. Neither would I. Years have passed since that night in the Amazon, but the memories are as vivid as ever. I've hunted many creatures in my time, but none like those in São Miguel. I still don't know what they were, or where they came from. Maybe I never will. But one thing is certain. There are things in this world that defy explanation, things that shouldn't exist but do. And sometimes, the only thing standing between them and the rest of us is a soldier with a gun and a lot of unanswered questions. I've kept hunting, kept searching for answers. But deep down, I know that some things are better left undiscovered, some doors better left unopened. Because out there, in the darkness, the Mapinguari and its kin are still waiting, still watching. And one day, they'll come for me again. But until that day comes, I'll keep fighting, keep hunting, because that's all I know how to do. And maybe, just maybe, it's enough. I never wanted to be a soldier. Growing up in the backwoods of Pennsylvania, all I wanted was to be left alone, to hunt, and to fish. But the world has a way of pulling you into its madness, whether you like it or not. The draft in 68 left me with no choice but to don the uniform and learn how to kill men I never met. Vietnam took a lot from me, friends, innocence, and a good part of my sanity. But what happened in the jungles of Southeast Asia was nothing compared to what I would face later on, far from any battlefield, in a place where the lines between reality and legend blurred. It was the winter of 78, just shy of a decade after I left the military. I'd been working as a contractor, taking odd jobs wherever I could find them. Most of the time I kept to myself, drifting from town to town, trying to outrun memories that never seemed to fade. I had developed a reputation among certain circles for being able to handle the unusual. Cryptids, they called them. Creatures of folklore, the things that go bump in the night. Most of the time it was nothing more than wild dogs, escaped zoo animals, or paranoid locals seeing things in the dark. But every now and then, the stories had some teeth. I was in Stockholm, trying to stay warm with a bottle of whiskey, when the call came. It was an old army buddy, Carl. We hadn't spoken in years, but he found me through mutual contacts. He said he needed help with something that was well out of his depth. Carl had settled in Sweden after the war, 
marrying a local girl and setting up a small farm in Vermland, a remote province in the center of the country. His voice was shaky, his words hurried. This was not the calm, composed man I'd known during the war. They're missing, John. My wife and daughter. They're gone. Something took them, he said, his voice cracking like a dry branch. I tried to pry more information out of him, but he was barely coherent. All I could make out was that something had been killing livestock in the area for weeks. And then, one night, his family disappeared without a trace. The local authorities wrote it off as a bear attack, but Carl wasn't buying it. Neither was I. I hopped on the next plane to Sweden, a gut feeling telling me this wasn't going to be like any of my previous jobs. The cold hit me like a freight train the moment I stepped off the plane in Stockholm. I rented a car and drove west toward Vermland, the landscape gradually changing from urban sprawl to dense forests and frozen lakes. As I drove deeper into the wilderness, an unsettling feeling settled over me, a heavy sense of dread that only grew stronger the closer I got to Carl's farm. When I finally arrived, the place was eerily quiet. The farmhouse stood against the backdrop of a dark, sprawling forest, its windows reflecting the gray, overcast sky. Carl greeted me at the door, his face gaunt, eyes hollow. He looked like he hadn't slept in days. They're still out there, John. I can feel it, he muttered, leading me inside. The house was in disarray, furniture overturned, blankets strewn about as if a struggle had taken place. He showed me the back door, which was splintered as if something had forced its way in. They didn't take anything. No valuables, no food, nothing. Just them, Carl said, his voice barely above a whisper. We spent the rest of the day combing through the woods behind the farm, looking for any sign of his wife and daughter. The snow-covered ground showed no tracks, no clues, just an empty, endless expanse of trees and silence. As night fell, the temperature dropped even further, and a thick fog rolled in from the forest, making it impossible to see more than a few feet ahead. We returned to the farmhouse, defeated. Carl poured us both a drink, and we sat in silence for a while. Then he began to talk, about the stories he'd heard from the locals, tales passed down through generations. They spoke of a creature, a beast that roamed the forests of Vermland, a being neither man nor animal, but something else entirely. It was said to prey on the weak, the vulnerable, taking them in the dead of night, never to be seen again. I'd heard stories like this before in different parts of the world, but something about the way Carl spoke, his eyes wide with fear, made me take it seriously. He wasn't a man prone to superstition, yet here he was, clutching at these old tales like they were the only explanation that made sense. That night, I barely slept. The wind howled outside, rattling the windows, but there was something else a distant, mournful wail that echoed through the forest. I told myself it was just the wind, but deep down, I knew better. I kept my rifle close, my senses on high alert, every creak of the floorboards putting me on edge. The next morning, I decided to pay a visit to the local authorities. They were about as helpful as a toothless guard dog, dismissing Carl's claims as the ravings of a desperate man. According to them, it was a simple case of a bear attack. No more, no less. But I knew what bears could do, and this didn't fit. There was no blood, no tracks, nothing to suggest a struggle. Bears don't just take people without leaving a trace. Frustrated, I returned to the farm and decided to explore the forest on my own. I spent the entire day wandering through the dense woods, following animal trails and searching for anything that might lead me to the truth. The deeper I went, the more oppressive the atmosphere became. The trees seemed to close in around me, their gnarled branches like skeletal hands reaching out from the shadows. As dusk approached, I stumbled upon an old, abandoned cabin deep in the woods. It looked like it hadn't been touched in years. The windows boarded up, the door hanging off its hinges. Something about the place felt wrong, like it didn't belong there, like it was a relic of a time long forgotten. 
I pushed the door open and stepped inside, my breath visible in the cold air. The interior was dark and musty, the floor covered in a thick layer of dust. But what caught my attention was a series of strange symbols carved into the walls, symbols I didn't recognize, angular, almost runic in nature. They sent a chill down my spine, but I couldn't decipher their meaning. I spent the next few hours searching the cabin, but there was nothing of value, just old, rotting furniture and more of those strange carvings. As I was about to leave, I noticed something odd about one of the floorboards near the fireplace. It was loose, the wood warped and cracked as if it had been pried up and replaced. I wedged my knife into the gap and lifted the board, revealing a small compartment beneath. Inside was a leather-bound journal, its pages yellowed with age. The handwriting was barely legible, written in a language I didn't recognize. I flipped through the pages, and though I couldn't read the words, the drawings were enough to make my blood run cold. They depicted a creature, a monstrous figure with elongated limbs and a face twisted into an inhuman snarl. The last few pages were covered in frantic scribbles, the ink smeared as if the writer had been in a hurry. I took the journal with me and left the cabin, the sun already setting. The walk back to the farmhouse was a long one, the forest alive with the sounds of the night. Every snap of a twig, every rustle of leaves had me on edge, my finger resting on the trigger of my rifle. I didn't see anything, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that something was out there, lurking just beyond the trees. When I finally returned to the farmhouse, Carl was waiting for me, his eyes filled with a mix of hope and despair. I showed him the journal, and though he couldn't read it either, the drawing seemed to confirm his worst fears. We sat in silence for a while, the weight of our situation hanging heavy in the air. Then, as if on cue, the wailing started again, a low, mournful sound that seemed to come from all around us. Carl's face went pale, and he reached for his rifle, his hands trembling. It's close, he whispered, his voice barely audible. I nodded, my own nerves fraying. We moved to the windows, scanning the darkness outside, but there was nothing to see. Just the endless expanse of trees and shadows. The wailing grew louder, more insistent, and then suddenly it stopped. The silence that followed was deafening, the kind that makes your ears ring and your heart race. And then... Out of the corner of my eye, I saw it, movement in the trees, a shadow that seemed to flicker in and out of existence. I raised my rifle, my finger on the trigger, but before I could take aim, it was gone, swallowed by the darkness. Carl and I spent the rest of the night on edge, every creak and groan of the house setting our nerves on fire, but whatever was out there didn't show itself again. By dawn, we were exhausted, our nerves frayed to the breaking point. We knew we couldn't keep this up, that we had to find a way to end this nightmare. Carl suggested we visit an old man who lived on the outskirts of the village, a recluse who was said to be knowledgeable about the old ways, the ancient legends. Desperate for answers, I agreed. The old man's house was even more remote than Carl's farm, a small, dilapidated shack nestled deep in the woods. He greeted us with a wary eye, clearly not accustomed to visitors, especially not strangers. But when Carl explained our situation, the old man's expression softened, and he invited us inside. His home was cluttered with all manner of strange objects, herbs hanging from the ceiling, animal bones arranged in intricate patterns, and more of those strange symbols carved into the walls. He sat us down by the fire and began to speak, his voice low and raspy. You are dealing with an ancient spirit, he said, his eyes locked on mine. A creature born of the forest, a guardian of sorts, but one that has been twisted by the passage of time. He explained that the beast was not inherently evil, but it had become corrupted, its purpose warped. It preyed on those who encroached on its territory, those who disturbed the natural order, the symbols in the cabin, he said, were wards meant to keep the creature at bay. But they had been damaged, their power weakened. 
The only way to stop it, the old man continued, is to restore the balance, to appease the spirit. He handed us a small, intricately carved wooden figure, an effigy of the creature. You must return this to the forest, to the place where the creature was first awakened. There, you will find an ancient tree, twisted and gnarled. Bury the effigy at its roots, and the spirit will be appeased. Carl and I had no choice but to trust him. We left the old man's house with the effigy and made our way back to the farm. The sun was setting by the time we reached the edge of the forest, the sky tinged with the last hues of daylight. We ventured deep into the woods, guided only by the old man's words and the faint light of the moon. After what felt like hours, we found the tree, a massive ancient oak, its bark twisted and gnarled like the face of an old man. The ground around it was bare, the roots exposed and tangled like the veins of the earth. We dug a small hole at the base of the tree and placed the effigy inside. As we covered it with soil, a sudden gust of wind swept through the forest, carrying with it a sound, a low, mournful wail that echoed through the trees. Then, just as suddenly, the wind died down and the forest fell silent. The oppressive atmosphere that had hung over us for days seemed to lift, replaced by a sense of calm. The air was still, the night quiet, as if the forest itself was at peace. Carl and I returned to the farmhouse, exhausted but relieved. The next morning the authorities arrived, responding to Carl's earlier report. They combed through the woods, searching for any sign of his wife and daughter, but there was nothing. No tracks, no bodies, no evidence of foul play. It was as if they had vanished into thin air. Days turned into weeks, and life slowly returned to normal. The livestock stopped disappearing, the strange wailing in the night ceased, and the oppressive atmosphere that had plagued the farm was gone. But Carl was never the same. The loss of his family weighed heavily on him, and though he tried to move on, the pain was too great. A year later, I received a letter from Carl. He had sold the farm and moved to a small village in the north, far from the forests of Vermland. The letter was brief, but it ended with a chilling note. I still hear them at night, John. I hear their voices, calling to me from the woods. I don't think it's over. I don't think it will ever be over. I never saw Carl again after that. I continued my work, moving from town to town, hunting the things that most people don't believe in. But the memory of Vermland stayed with me, a reminder that some things can't be explained, can't be fought, can't be killed. Somewhere, deep in the forests of Sweden, the beast of Vermland still roams, its spirit forever tied to the land, waiting for the next unsuspecting soul to cross its path. And as for Carl, I can only hope that he found peace, though I fear that he, like me, will always be haunted by the things that go bump in the night. The wind was slicing through my face like a dull blade, the kind of cold that gets into your bones and stays there. It was the winter of 1995, deep in the Yamal Peninsula, Russia. My name's Thomas Haynes, and I've seen things most people wouldn't believe even if I showed them the scars. I've been a soldier for the better part of my life, but it's not the human wars that haunt me. It's the ones fought in the dark, against creatures most folks only whisper about after a few too many drinks. My specialty? Cryptids. Monsters of legend, myth, and nightmare. They say every story has a grain of truth in it, and after twenty years in this line of work, I can tell you that's no exaggeration. They exist, and they kill. The Yamal assignment came to me through a man I've only met once, in a bar in Vladivostok. I was nursing a cheap vodka when he slid a dossier across the table. His name was Yuri, though I doubted that was real, and he didn't talk much. The file was thin, too thin for comfort, but it had a picture that caught my eye. It was of a reindeer carcass, splayed open, its rib cage picked clean, but not by wolves or any scavengers I recognized. The wounds were surgical, precise, and in some places, the bones looked melted. The locals, 
reindeer herders known as Nenets, were scared. I've met scared people before, but this was different. They weren't just afraid. They were desperate. In the past two months, six people had gone missing, along with nearly a dozen reindeer. And when the bodies were found, they looked just like that photo. The last person to go missing was a young boy, only 12 years old. His mother found his boots at the edge of the woods, but that was it. No tracks, no blood, just empty snow. Yuri said it was a folklore creature, a legend that the Nenets had spoken of in hushed tones for centuries. The Chotgor. A spirit or creature, it wasn't clear which, that haunted the deep woods and came out in the dead of winter to feed. The name alone made the old women cross themselves, and the men avoid the woods after dusk. I wasn't superstitious, but I was smart enough to know that legends like this didn't survive centuries without reason. I agreed to take the job, mostly because I knew what would happen if I didn't. Someone else would go, someone unprepared, and they wouldn't come back. I've always been good at surviving, so I packed my gear, night vision goggles, a scoped rifle, my old combat knife, and a few other tricks of the trade. I was ready for anything, or so I thought. The village was small, just a scattering of wooden huts half buried in snow. The people there were gaunt, with hollow eyes that tracked me warily as I arrived. Yuri had set me up with a guide, a man named Sergei, who had the build of a bear and a face like old leather. He didn't say much, which suited me fine. The less chatter, the better. We headed into the woods that afternoon. The trees were tall and close, their black trunks like teeth against the pale sky. There was no sound but the crunch of our boots in the snow. Sergei led the way, his breath visible in the freezing air, while I kept my eyes on the shadows, my finger resting lightly on the trigger of my rifle. The woods were wrong. I've been in forests all over the world, but there was something about these trees that felt different. The silence wasn't just the absence of noise. It was like the woods were holding their breath, waiting. I noticed there were no animal tracks, no birds, no deer, nothing. It was as if the entire forest had emptied out, leaving only us and whatever was out there. After a few hours of trudging through the snow, Sergei stopped. He pointed to a patch of disturbed snow at the base of a tree. Kneeling, I brushed it aside, revealing the remains of a fire. The ash was still warm, and there were half-burned sticks scattered around. Someone had been here recently. Sergei gestured to a pile of stones nearby, a crude marker for a grave. It was clear enough what had happened. Someone hadn't made it back to the village. Sergei muttered something under his breath, and for the first time, I saw fear in his eyes. He pointed deeper into the woods, his hand trembling slightly. Chotgor, he whispered, then turned and started back the way we'd come, leaving me standing alone by the grave. I stayed there for a while, listening to the wind as it rustled through the trees. The air was thick with something I couldn't quite place, something old, something dangerous. I knew then that this was no ordinary hunt. That night I set up camp near the fire pit, but I didn't sleep. I kept my back to a large tree, my rifle across my lap, and my eyes scanning the darkness. Around midnight the wind died down, and the silence returned, heavier than before. That's when I heard it. A sound like bones cracking under pressure, coming from somewhere just beyond the light of my fire. I stood, slowly, every muscle in my body tense. The sound came again closer this time, and with it, a smell, a rancid stench like something rotting in the sun. I turned in a slow circle, my rifle raised, trying to pinpoint where it was coming from, but the darkness was complete, and even my night vision goggles didn't help. Whatever it was, it wasn't human. I'd faced wolves, bears, and worse, but this, this was different. It was smarter. Then I saw them, eyes reflecting the firelight just at the edge of the trees. Not the yellow eyes of an animal, but something red, 
something wrong. They were too high off the ground, too wide set. My heart pounded as I aimed my rifle, but before I could fire, they disappeared, and the woods were silent again. I stayed like that, frozen, for what felt like hours, but there was nothing more. Finally, as the first light of dawn crept through the trees, I let myself relax, but only a little. Whatever it was, it had been watching me, sizing me up, and I had the distinct impression that it had decided to let me live, at least for now. The next day I tracked the creature, though I wasn't sure if it was tracking me. The snow was falling lightly, masking any tracks, and the woods were as silent as ever. I followed the general direction where I'd seen the eyes, but there was nothing. No tracks, no sign of passage. It was as if whatever it was had vanished into thin air. I found more graves, though. Not as fresh as the first, but recent enough. The same crude markers. The same cold ashes. Whoever had died out here had been desperate, trying to survive the night. I wondered how many graves were scattered throughout these woods. How many people had come face to face with the Chotgore and lost. By mid-afternoon, I was deep in the forest, far from the village, when I stumbled upon something that made my blood run cold. It was a clearing, perfectly round, and at the center was a massive stone, covered in strange carvings. They weren't Russian, or any language I recognized. The air around the stone felt thicker, heavier, as if I were walking through water. The carvings seemed to pulse, and the longer I looked at them, the more they seemed to move, shifting like living things. I knew better than to get closer. I'd seen sights like this before, places where the veil between our world and something else was thin. But this one was different. It was older, more powerful. The kind of place that was a beacon to things best left in the dark. That's when I heard it again. The cracking of bones, this time louder and much closer. I spun around, but there was nothing. The sound came again, from behind me, then from the side, as if it was circling me. I tightened my grip on the rifle, trying to stay calm, but the feeling of being hunted was overwhelming. This wasn't a creature out for food. This was something playing with its prey. I started backing away from the stone, keeping my rifle trained on the trees, but I knew it was no use. It was toying with me enjoying the fear. Then, just as suddenly as it had started, the sounds stopped, and the clearing was silent again. But the silence wasn't comforting. It was oppressive, like the forest was holding its breath, waiting for something. That's when I felt it. A presence, just behind me. I turned, too slowly, and saw it, standing at the edge of the clearing. It was tall, impossibly tall, its body gaunt and twisted, like a man who'd been stretched too far. Its skin was pale, almost translucent, and its eyes were those same red orbs I'd seen the night before, burning with a malevolent intelligence. But the worst part was its mouth, too wide, too full of sharp, needle-like teeth that were stained with something dark. The chot gore. It didn't move, just watched me, as if waiting for me to make the first move. My instincts screamed at me to run, but I knew better. This thing was faster than I was, and running would only make it more excited. So I did the only thing I could. I raised my rifle and fired. The bullet hit it square in the chest, but it didn't even flinch. It just tilted its head, almost curiously, as if it was surprised I'd even tried. Then it started to move, slowly at first, then faster its limbs bending at unnatural angles as it closed the distance between us. I fired again and again, each shot hitting its mark, but nothing stopped it. It was like trying to stop a nightmare with a BB gun. Finally, I threw the rifle aside and pulled out my knife. It wasn't much, but it was all I had left. The Chotgore was almost on me when I lunged forward, aiming for its throat. But it was too fast. It swatted me aside like I was nothing, and I hit the ground hard, the wind knocked out of me. I rolled over, gasping for breath, 
and saw it standing over me, its mouth opening wider, those teeth glinting in the dim light. I thought that was it, that I was done. But then, out of nowhere, a shot rang out, and the Chotgore jerked back, a dark spray of blood, or something like it, bursting from its side. I looked up, dazed, and saw Sergei standing at the edge of the clearing, his rifle smoking. He fired again, hitting it in the head this time, and the creature shrieked, a high, keening sound that made my ears bleed. But it wasn't enough. The Chotgore turned on him, moving faster than anything that size should, and Sergei barely had time to get off one more shot before it was on him. I tried to get up, tried to help, but my body wouldn't cooperate. I could only watch as the Chotgore tore into him, those teeth ripping through flesh and bone like paper. His screams echoed through the clearing, and then suddenly, there was silence. The Chotgore straightened, blood dripping from its mouth, and looked back at me. For a moment I thought it was going to finish the job, but then it turned and disappeared into the woods, leaving me alone in the snow. I don't know how long I lay there, staring up at the sky, before I finally managed to get to my feet. My body was a mess of pain, but I was alive. Somehow, I had survived. But Sergei, he was gone. Nothing left but a torn and bloodied mass on the ground. I stumbled back to the village, half frozen and in shock. The locals didn't say anything when they saw me, just gave me that same haunted look as before. They knew what had happened, and they knew I wasn't the first to come back alone. The Yamal Peninsula is still out there, still cold and unforgiving. The Chotgore is still out there too, waiting in the dark woods for the next fool who thinks they can hunt it. I left Russia shortly after that, went back to the States and tried to put it behind me. But some nights, when the wind howls just right, I can still hear those bones cracking, still see those red eyes in the dark. I've hunted a lot of things in my life, seen a lot of horrors, but that night in Yamal, it's the one that keeps me up at night. Because I know that out there, somewhere in the cold, something is waiting. And one day, it'll come for me again. But this time, I'll be ready. When I first joined the military, I never imagined my life would take such a dark turn. Back then, I was a young man eager to serve my country, traveling the world and hunting the enemies of the state. But after years of seeing the worst humanity had to offer, I was recruited into a covert unit that hunted something far more elusive, cryptids. For those unfamiliar, cryptids are creatures that exist in the margins of folklore, legends passed down through generations but never fully substantiated by science. Our unit's job was to investigate and, if necessary, eliminate any credible threats. My first encounter with the supernatural took place in 1987, deep in the forests of the Chumash Wilderness in California. The Chumash people had lived in those parts for centuries, and their folklore was full of strange tales about shadowy figures in the woods. Our mission was to investigate a series of brutal killings that had the local sheriff's department baffled. Officially, they were chalking it up to wild animal attacks. Bears, perhaps. But the mutilations were too precise, too deliberate, to be the work of any known animal. We were a small team, just five of us. There was me, Jackson, the team leader, a no-nonsense ex-marine named Owens, our tracker Samuels, and Doc, our medic. We were all hardened men, used to seeing the unimaginable, but as we trudged deeper into the Chumash wilderness, I could sense the unease among us. The trees were dense, their twisted branches forming a canopy that blocked out the sun. The deeper we went, the darker it got, even though it was still midday. There was an unnatural silence that followed us, broken only by the occasional rustling of leaves and the distant caw of a bird. Samuels, who had Native American ancestry and was well-versed in the local lore, mentioned that the Chumash believed in a creature they called the Dark Watcher. According to legend, it was an ancient being that roamed the hills and forests, preying on those who wandered too far from the beaten path. The Chumash elders warned against even speaking its name, for to acknowledge it was to invite its attention. 
I had always been skeptical of such tales, chalking them up to the imagination of primitive minds trying to make sense of the world around them. But as the days passed, and we ventured further into the wilderness, I began to feel the weight of something watching us. It wasn't just paranoia. There was something palpably wrong with the air, something that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. On the third night, we set up camp by a small stream. We were miles from the nearest town, completely isolated. As darkness fell, we gathered around the fire, eating our MREs in silence. Even Owens, usually the one to crack a joke to ease the tension, was unusually quiet. I noticed Samuels sitting apart from the rest of us, his eyes scanning the tree line, as if expecting something to emerge at any moment. That night, I had the first of what would become many sleepless nights. I lay in my sleeping bag, staring up at the inky black sky, listening to the sounds of the forest. But instead of the usual chorus of crickets and nightbirds, there was nothing. Just an oppressive silence that seemed to grow heavier with each passing hour. Sometime after midnight, I heard it. A faint rustling, like something large moving through the underbrush. I propped myself up on my elbows, straining to see into the darkness beyond the firelight. The rustling grew louder, closer. I grabbed my rifle, scanning the trees, my heart pounding in my chest. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw it. A shadow, tall and thin, standing just beyond the reach of the firelight. I blinked, thinking my eyes were playing tricks on me, but when I looked again, it was still there. It didn't move, didn't make a sound. Just stood there, watching. Jackson, I whispered, nudging him awake. He stirred, groggy, but when he saw the look on my face, he grabbed his rifle and followed my gaze. What the hell, he muttered, his voice barely audible. The figure remained motionless for what felt like an eternity, and then, as suddenly as it had appeared, it was gone. One moment it was there. The next, it wasn't. No sound. No movement. Just gone. We didn't sleep for the rest of the night. At dawn we searched the area where the figure had been, but there were no tracks, no signs that anything had been there at all. Samuels was visibly shaken, muttering something in his native tongue. I couldn't shake the feeling that whatever we were dealing with was far beyond our comprehension. That day, we found the remains of the first victim. It was a gruesome sight. Bones picked clean, scattered across the forest floor. But what struck me was the precision of the mutilation. The cuts were clean, almost surgical, as if done by a blade rather than an animal's teeth. Doc examined the remains, his face pale. This wasn't an animal, he said quietly. This was done by something with intelligence. We pressed on, following the faint trail of blood and bones deeper into the forest. By now, the fear was tangible, hanging over us like a shroud. Even Owens, who had seen more than his fair share of horrors in combat, was visibly unnerved. As night fell, we set up camp again, though none of us expected to get any sleep. We took turns standing watch, each man staring into the darkness, listening for any sign of the creature. It was during Samuel's watch that it came for us. I was half asleep, my rifle clutched in my hands, when I heard him shout, It's here! We all scrambled to our feet, weapons at the ready, but it was too late. The figure from the night before was back, but this time it wasn't alone. Shadows moved through the trees, dozens of them, circling our camp like predators stalking their prey. We opened fire, the staccato bursts of gunfire echoing through the trees, but the bullets seemed to pass right through them, hitting nothing but air. The shadows continued to close in, their forms flickering in and out of existence like phantoms. Samuels was the first to fall. One of the shadows reached out and before we could react, he was gone. Pulled into the darkness, his scream cut off abruptly. We fired into the blackness, but there was nothing to hit, nothing to fight. Fall back, Jackson ordered, his voice hoarse with panic. We grabbed our gear and ran, abandoning the camp, the fire, everything. 
The shadows pursued us, flitting through the trees, always just out of reach, their eyes glowing with an unnatural light. We ran for what felt like hours, until our lungs burned and our legs threatened to give out. Finally, we broke through the trees and stumbled into a clearing. There, in the center, was an ancient stone altar, covered in strange symbols. The shadows halted at the edge of the clearing, as if unable to cross some invisible barrier. We collapsed to the ground, gasping for breath, our eyes fixed on the shadows that surrounded us. Why aren't they attacking? Owens panted, his rifle trained on the shadows. Jackson shook his head. I don't know. Maybe they can't. Maybe this place is sacred or something. Samuel's disappearance weighed heavily on us, but we had no time to mourn. The shadows remained at the edge of the clearing, watching, waiting. We couldn't stay there forever, and we knew it. We had to find a way out of the forest, back to civilization, but the only way out was through the trees, where the shadows waited. As dawn approached, the shadows began to fade, melting into the darkness from which they came. But I knew they would return with the night. We had one chance to escape, and we had to take it. We moved quickly, making our way through the forest, following the faint trails left by the Chumash. The forest seemed to close in around us, the trees pressing closer together as if trying to trap us. But we kept moving, driven by fear and desperation. By midday we reached the edge of the forest, the trees giving way to open plains. But as we stepped out of the tree line, I felt a cold wind at my back, as if something was following us, urging us to leave and never return. We didn't stop until we reached the nearest town, a small, isolated community that looked at us with suspicion and fear. We reported Samuels as missing in action, but I knew in my heart that he was dead. The military classified the mission as a failure, chalking it up to a wild animal attack. But I knew better. I left the unit not long after that, haunted by what I had seen, by the shadows that still lingered in the corners of my mind. I tried to put it behind me, to live a normal life, but there are some things you can't outrun. The Chumash had known it all along. There are places in this world where the lines between reality and legend blur, where ancient beings walk the earth, and where those who stray too far from the path are never seen again. Years later, I returned to the Chumash wilderness, not out of a sense of duty, but because I needed answers. The memories of that mission had never left me. They haunted my dreams filled with shadows and the sound of Samuel's scream echoing in the darkness. The rest of the team had gone their separate ways. Jackson drank himself into oblivion, Doc moved to a small town in Montana, and Owens, last I heard, was living off the grid somewhere in Alaska. But I couldn't shake the need to confront whatever it was that had taken my friend to find some semblance of closure. I reached out to the Chumash elders, hoping they might shed some light on what we had encountered. They were hesitant to speak with me at first, but after some persistence, one of the older women, a respected elder named Anuka, agreed to meet with me. We sat in her small, humble home on the outskirts of the forest. The walls were adorned with ancient symbols and artifacts, and a faint smell of sage hung in the air. Anuka was a small woman, her face lined with the wisdom and weariness of many years, her eyes sharp and knowing. You encountered the Dark Watchers, she said without preamble, her voice raspy with age. I nodded, not trusting myself to speak. They are not of this world, she continued. They are spirits, guardians of this land, older than the mountains themselves. They watch over the forest, protecting it from those who would do it harm. But we didn't do anything, I protested, the frustration and fear bubbling up after all these years. We were just trying to find out what was happening, to stop the killings. Anuka shook her head slowly. It does not matter. You were outsiders, invaders in their domain. The forest is their home, and they protect it fiercely. The Chumash have always respected the boundaries, knowing that to trespass would invite their wrath. I wanted to argue, to tell her that we had no choice, that we were following orders. But deep down, I knew it wouldn't matter. 
The Dark Watchers didn't care about our reasons or our mission. To them, we were just another threat to their sacred land. What happened to my friend? I asked quietly, dreading the answer. Anuka looked at me with a sadness that made my chest tighten. He is with them now, part of their world. They do not kill like we do. They take. Those who are taken become part of the forest, their souls bound to the land forever. He will not suffer, but he will never leave. I swallowed hard, the weight of her words sinking in. Samuels was gone, not just dead, but trapped in a place where I could never reach him, lost to a force beyond my understanding. Is there any way to bring him back? I asked, though I already knew the answer. Anuka shook her head again. Once they take someone, they do not return them. The forest must be respected, and its guardians must be left undisturbed. I left her home feeling emptier than before, the closure I had sought slipping further out of reach. There was no fighting the Dark Watchers, no understanding them. They were ancient, primal forces, indifferent to human desires or suffering. Years have passed since that meeting, and I've never returned to the Chumash wilderness. The nightmares still come, though less frequently now, and I've learned to live with the memories of that place, the shadows that lurk in the corners of my mind. I've come to accept that there are things in this world that we will never fully understand, forces that exist beyond the grasp of human comprehension. The others are all gone now. Owens disappeared into the wilderness one winter, and his body was never found. Jackson drank himself to death in a dingy motel room, and Doc passed away quietly in his sleep, alone in his cabin in Montana. I'm the last one left, the last one who remembers what happened in those woods. I've thought about writing it all down, telling the world what we encountered, but I know it wouldn't make a difference. People would dismiss it as the ramblings of a broken man, a soldier who saw too much and lost his grip on reality. And maybe they'd be right. But I know what I saw. What we all saw. And it wasn't something that can be easily explained or forgotten. The Chumash wilderness remains untouched, a place where few dare to venture. The locals still speak in hushed tones about the dark watchers, warning travelers to stay away, to respect the boundaries. And every now and then, I hear about someone who went into the woods and never came back, another soul taken by the shadows. I've learned to live with the uncertainty, to accept that there are mysteries that will never be solved, horrors that will never be fully understood. But I'll never forget the night the shadows came for us in the Chumash wilderness, and the friend we lost to the darkness. And so, I go on living, a soldier without a war, a hunter without a prey, haunted by the memories of a mission that should never have been. The world moves on, and so do I, but the shadows are always there, just beyond the edge of the light, watching, waiting. Some nights, when the wind is just right, I can almost hear Samuel's voice calling to me from the darkness, but I know better than to answer. I know that some things are better left in the shadows, where they belong. This is my story, the one I've kept hidden for so long. I'm telling it now, not because I want sympathy or understanding, but because the world needs to know that there are places, ancient and forgotten, where the rules of man do not apply. Places where the line between legend and reality blurs, where the past is alive and the present is just a fleeting moment in the grand scheme of things. If you ever find yourself deep in the wilderness, far from the safety of civilization, and you feel that cold wind at your back, that prickle of unease in the pit of your stomach. Remember this. There are things in the world that cannot be fought, only respected. And if you ever see a shadow moving in the trees, turn back, go home, and don't look back. For some battles cannot be won, and some creatures are best left alone. The Chumash knew this, and now... So do I.